see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleam. We give you thanks for this great country of ours that was founded upon the dignity of human life and the values of human freedom. May we who are recipients of the fruits of the sacrifices made by our soldiers from the beginning of our country never take for granted all that you have given to our country. It wasn't fashionable to be a Vietnam veteran in 1978. It wasn't fashionable to build a memorial to those that died in Vietnam. South Boston, with its great history of pride, loyalty, came together to help a committee of five Vietnam veterans raise the funds to build this memorial. Welcome to South Boston. South Boston is one of the oldest and the most historic communities in all of America. We are quite proud of our history here in South Boston. And no matter where you came from, where you were born, you become immersed in the cherished uh, values, traditions, and principles of this, uh, of this extraordinary, extraordinary town. This is the oldest Catholic church uh, in New England. And who are buried here, we have Civil War veterans. We have the first Irish Catholic Boston police officer. Um, we have the first black Catholic priest is buried inside the church. I'm here this morning because I have family here. My grandparents, John and Al Helen Havlin, are here. My uncle John is here. Um, I have two cousins, Jerry and Eddie, and they're buried here. So we, we're, we like to make sure that it's taken care of and it's um, well kept, taken care of our own. This is my father right here. So my father was born in 1897 in Naples, Italy. And then he came, after he served in the military, he came to this country in 1920. Came to Boston first, then he had to go to New York. That's where his sponsor was, because back then you had to have a job. And then my father came back to Boston. He became a citizen. I have his citizen papers too. And he worked for Walworth Company for 47 years. When they came here, when these immigrants came here, they became part of this remarkable mosaic of uh, the melting pot of America. My father came to this country alone when he was 15 years old. And he, you know, in those days you had to have somebody to sponsor you. But, you know, he had $25 in his pocket. He had a, he had a job as a tailor's apprentice. My dad would work every night, always work the night shift, 11 or midnight to 8. Um, he'd get up every night, put on his work boots, didn't take any nights off. Uh, my mother, she always worked. She was a waitress. So both of them did what they needed to do to give us the things for us uh, to succeed. Uh, but the fortunate thing is that what they didn't do was they didn't coddle us and give us things that were unnecessary. Um, what they really provided was the love, the understanding, the discipline. You know, we were like broomsticks. There wasn't a pick on us because we, 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 we never had anything. But we were all the same. Yeah. You know, there, there was no, nobody was better than the, the, each other. We, we, we dressed the same, we, we played ball together, we got along terrific together, because that's what we had was a friendship that was always there. I'm here and I'll always be here. Growing up with kids I knew since uh, way back. <clears throat> Practicing football one day and Somebody said they just bombed Pearl Harbor. He says, "Who cares? Uh, give me the ball. That's how much we knew about sure, it." Sure, we were playing we, ball. We, we just didn't kids. care. Yeah, yeah. So that's the way. It didn't mean anything to us then. What, fifteen? Yeah, yeah, fifteen years old. One of those values that they they had was sense of loyalty, loyalty to family, to religion, to faith, country, but also loyalty to themselves and their friends. Uh, we're a neighborhood of uh, different communities, even within this neighborhood. So it would be these 
young men mostly that would leave their families, leave the corners, and go off and fight in war halfway around the world. So I, I, I joined up. There was about three or four of us in the corner that weren't in the reserves. So when it was, they went, they were called back in. In fact, of the five or six of them that were called back in, they didn't go to Korea right away. I was in Korea before they were. They eventually ended up there. Thank God none of them get killed. But that's what it all comes down to. But I'll tell you, when, when, when you're 17, 18, or 19, nothing, nothing bothers you. No, you, you just you just go right along with it. You know, you, you hear them telling you, telling these kids this and that, you just shake your head because you're from Southie. You already street smart. Like, I remember a joke and like all these, the obstacle course in the Marines or the Army or the Navy, and it's like, you know, that's what we're used to, jumping fences and running yeah. around. <laughs> and relieve you, yeah. Playing, yeah, so it's like, it almost like growing up in Southie, it just, it almost just fit in the military. It's just a natural progression. Uh, for his actions down there, he was awarded the Navy Cross. Uh, and he, he was killed five days before his 19th birthday. And uh, today I wonder what he would look like, what kind of a life he would have left, how we would have got along, we would have bullshit about the law, and so forth and so on. It's, uh, it's just, uh, it's a little hole in your heart. And that we were very close growing up. And but that's, uh, that's the way it goes, I guess. No, we can know about it, but I still miss him today, even though it's 60 some more years later. Okay? We're here to remember our sons, our dads, our brothers, our friends, and not how they died, but how they lived. We remember John Calhoun as an artist who won several art awards from the Boston Globe and received the Boston Museum of Fine Arts Scholarship. We remember John's unselfishness and loyalty to his friends. We remember his courage. One of his friends recalled John's unselfishness as they waited to deploy to Vietnam. If John had money, his friends had money. We remember Paul Sheehan. He attended English and drove a delivery truck to the City Point Fruit Market. He was described as a leader who consistently put himself at risk, checking on his men, putting their safety and their welfare ahead of his own. We remember John Joyce studying hard at Latin and at Boston State. We remember Jim O'Toole building three forts with his cousin and camping in the Blue Hills with his friends. We remember Bud Milan playing hockey and baseball. And we remember Dougie Eatry's artwork and his charming the bus driver on a tee to ride for free when he ran out of nickels. Today, we remember how each one of these young men and all the others remembered on this monument lived their lives and touched us along the way. We remember their service, their humor, their friendship, and we remember how much we miss them. Today, we remember the honorable service of those who served in Vietnam and how they helped our country mature. Today, we remember to never forget. Well, I'll tell you, it's a, it's a very interesting community, very interesting dynamic in its history. The history, of course, uh, is so important for, for people to understand because really the history of South Boston is really the history of the United States. It's a community, largely, of uh, poor immigrant people that came from different parts of the world. They settled in here looking for hope and opportunity, work, raise their family, uh, develop a career, and you see it today in many respects, it's the grandsons and the great-grandsons of those same immigrant people that made, were part of the making of uh, this great nation. The funniest thing is, I know I had, I know when I got out to Texas, you know, obviously the way, the way we talk, like, where are you from? And I'd be like, oh, I'm from Salty. And they couldn't understand why I wouldn't say Boston, but I'd say Salty, you always say your neighborhood. So I know it happened to me probably 25 times, like, oh, all right, this kid in, Second platoon, he's from, he's from Boston too. I think he's from Salty. I'm like, oh, this is great. I go to talk to the kid and he's from Swampscott. Uh, he's from Plymouth or something like that. Or even New Hampshire. Or yeah, New Hampshire, so. When people come and talk with us, the first thing we say, are you from Salty? 
if they if they say, I'm sorry, we say, are you from South Boston? If they say yes, they're home. We've had, like Pat said, the first gold medal winner from the United States was from Southie. Again, I mean, just look at the people, the politicians, the famous people from Southie, and you realize, wow, this is this is one zip code. Like this is one zip code, and all these people have come from here. I mean, it's Medal of Honor winners, professional athletes. Again, office. Speaker of the House is from Southie too, McCormick. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think the fact that it was a friendly place. Everybody knew everybody, your neighbors, your whoever you worked with. Uh, I, I just enjoyed it. You know, three kids sharing the same bedroom. Um, when we moved to this house from a previous house, um, my sister and I both got our own bedroom. We were the two oldest in the family. The other three boys had to share. Um, and we thought we were, were big, but I will tell you that our bedrooms had room for a bed and a bureau. And that was it. You live in a three-family house like this is right here. I live on the third floor. 25 years ago, you'd have three families living in this three-family, one on each floor. And back in the 60s, they only had one car. We used to walk everywhere. Nobody had a car. We just walked down Broadway, walked up Broadway, walked to the movie, walked to the grocery store. It was just a nice neighborhood. Mm -hmm. If you did something wrong and your parents didn't know about it, one of the neighbors would know about it. The environment's changing in Southie where it's, you know, young, uh, young singles, you know, urban professionals, they're move, moving into these condos and, you know, they're not having kids. They're just here to, you know, to, to see the bar scene, which Southie's always had, but it's, uh, it's changing as far as that goes. Um, I'm concerned you know, living here again now with my wife and where, you know, I'm lucky enough to be back in my grandparents' old house. Extremely lucky because, again, we, I couldn't afford it. You know, my wife's a teacher. I'm in the military. We, we make a decent living. I can't complain, but it's just so expensive here. And I, I'm concerned. I'm extremely worried that the upbringing, upbringing that I had here and my father and mother had and my grandparents had that my son or daughter is not going to be able to get. Uh, when busing started, people started to move out. Not because they could, not because they didn't like this town. It's just they just didn't want to have their kids bus to another school. So they moved. Most of them, believe it or not, moved to the South Shore. And then what happens is later on, people started to sell their homes. Developers got a great idea. Let's turn these three deckers into condos. So the good thing is, people are taking better care of their property. Because now you don't have a landlord that's not an absentee. You have people that actually own the building and they keep it up and they do a good job. The bad thing is there are no families here anymore because a family couldn't afford to spend $800,000 on a two bedroom condo. And every condo, there's three people living in every condo. Each condo has three cars. Nobody has a parking spot. The taxes have gone sky high. So a family, even if they wanted to move back here, they couldn't afford to buy it and they couldn't afford to pay the taxes on top of that. There are many families, many young people that would love to continue to live in South Boston. Unfortunately, the high cost of housing, now that may be something that is looked at it from a favorable point of view, from an economic point of view, from a business point of view, you know, that means there's stability in the community. That means that the housing is valuable. On the other hand, we want to make sure that there's housing available for working class families, for lifelong residents of South Boston whose mother and father and grandparents might have lived here, but they also want to be part of the community as well. And we don't want to outprice them out of the community that they have such a, an identification with. And that's really a challenge. I mean, it's a good challenge that we have. It's not deterioration and everybody wants to move out. I mean, we are almost a victim of our own success. We are becoming so sought after that everybody wants to live here. But we also want to make sure that our own people are able to live here. Well, I think Shelty, it changes every every 
20 years or whatever, like every place else. But the, there's no other place in the world I want to live than self. Anything that happened here always was uh, great news for the city. But the people here were, were all for you. They were back you up or anything you did. And it was a great community. I, I enjoyed living here. I wouldn't want to go anyplace else. I was born here, raised here, and I'll die here. And that will be it for me. It's interesting the term that it takes a, a village to raise a child. South Boston is, is probably one of the best villages that one can, uh, can come from. At the L, the great thing about that was the community that I felt, such a community down at the L. You could set a goal and others would cheer you on towards that goal. A lot of uh, people around who didn't necessarily have any benefit by uh, helping you out, but they were always trying to help you out just because uh, that's what people do in a community. When I coached, um, it, it's all volunteer, um, but again, it, it, it's something that you don't even think twice about. Um, one, I, I, I coach hockey. Um, I mean, I like to do it. It gets me out of the house during the winter. Um, but, you know, I just, th I think of it as I have something I can possibly give, give the kids because, um, again, I, that's what I got. Nobody was going to give you anything. You had to work hard to get that playing time. You had to work hard to make yourself better. And uh, I remember I went in for an operation when I was 15 years old and my coaches came in and brought me a cut from the Tribune and showed me that I was one of the top 10 batters in the league. Um, and I still remember that to this day, um, showing that, you know, I was the 50th pick and uh, ended up being one of the top 10 batters. You grew up with this attitude of wanting to be competitive, wanting to play sports wearing the colors, my case, so the colors of South Boston High School, red and blue. I mean, the best part of South is everyone walks everywhere, so, and everyone plays every sport imaginable. I mean, I think all of us, since we were four, five, six, you know, it was soccer, boxing, hockey, <coughs> basketball, baseball, and your parents just almost threw you out of there. I mean, we walked everywhere, McDonough Gym, Columbia Park, M Street. And I think you finally found out what sport you were the best in, probably when you were 10 or 11. But and that's where you meet all your friends growing up, mostly. You know, even if you didn't go to the same school with someone, you played hockey with them or you, you played baseball with them. And uh, it's funny how South is such a small area, but if you didn't play sports with someone, you wouldn't know someone on the other side of town, you know? We love the beaches. I know my mother. My mother's 88 years old. Up until two years ago, she swam every day that she could. We played tag football on the beach, we played volleyball on the beach, we played handball on the beach. I loved the beach so much that while I was in high school, I took a first aid, a first aid test and I got a job as a lifeguard on the beach. You know, when Southie was going through some stuff back in the 90s, they'd leave the rink open until 2 in the morning. So instead of us being 15 or 16 hanging on the corner getting in trouble, we were up skating. Um, you know, I know the McDonough gym used to be open on Friday night sometimes till midnight, just guys playing, kids playing basketball. Um, I think the best thing that sports did and Salty did, at least to help me out, was, I mean, you just, you never quit. They tried to make me quit. Uh, one time I had broken the record for the highest, uh, highest score on inspection, and the next time my score was a 40 out of 100 because they sent three drill instructors over to uh, do it. But throughout it all, every time I wanted to quit, I said, wait a minute, I'm from Salty. There's no way you yelling and screaming at me, making me do push-ups or sit-ups or something like that is going to make me quit and keep me from wanting to do uh, what I've always wanted to do in my life, and that was to be in the military and, and fly. I was in December 9, 1950, at yeah. uh, a place called Coterie. I was hit with a grenade in the, uh, in the face. I didn't always look like this. And... Uh, because of the situation at the time, they couldn't remove me for almost a day and a half. And at that time, I developed frostbite, which eventually led to the loss of my toes. So that's why I have the nickname around here, and I have no toes. Which I don't mind at all. I love it. No toes sold them. And that's, uh, that was it. But I came back, I played baseball, I played football, played basketball, I mean, it never bothered me. 
But it wasn't just about making us better athletes. It was about making us better people, better citizens. And that carried over into the military, into, into the workforce. Uh, even in our marriages, we were always try to be the team player. It's a lot of loyalty in this town. Everyone usually has each other's backs, no matter what. I call any of my friends, and no matter what kind of problem I have, they come and help me out of it. Another thing that I learned from South Boston is there were no self-made men. I remember somebody one time batting me in the back and saying, you know, you, you came a long way and you, you did it on your own. I did not do it on my own, that's for sure. I had uh, not only my family, obviously, like I'd spoken about, but uh, teachers at Latin school, uh, Costello, uh, Coach Costello, Conopasis, um, at, at Harvard, I had uh, friends who kind of uh, showed me the way some things that maybe perhaps I had not been exposed to. Uh, in the Navy, um, mentored by uh, commanders and other officers who saw maybe perhaps some talent in me. But uh, I had the same group of friends pretty much my whole life. And then uh, right after high school, we all decided to join the service. One went in the Marines, another one in the Air Force, Coast Guard, Navy, and then two in the Army. So it was pretty, mainly because uh, just the way we grew up here, loyalty and all that stuff. You're surrounded by it because everybody was or had been or will be in the service of one kind or another. There are so many veterans in this town that you just, if you ask them, are you a veteran, they'll say yes. There aren't very many that aren't. I remember in World War II, a family that lived next door to my grandmother, Millie, was in the Coast Guard. And I had never heard of a woman being in the Coast Guard who wasn't a nurse. Well, like Eddie said, if, if he don't join the Marines, I don't know what he's going to do. My father was from the old country and women didn't join the service. Women stayed home until they got married. My father finally relented, and the only reason he did that was because my brother Frank. I thought, oh, I'd love to be in the service. Joining the service, uh, you know, when I look back, it was most definitely the best decision I've made, uh, you know, in my life. It helped me, uh, you know, I'm on the fire department now. If it wasn't for the service, I never would have got that job. Me and, me and Ryan are in the fire academy together. Well, you know, the values that we learned at an early age growing up in South Boston, whether we learned them, maybe a combination of places at home, certainly, in our church, our community, from our friends, family, and, and that loyalty we had for our, for our country, patriotism, it's kind of interesting, so many of our young men and women who served our country, you know, not only did that nobly, but then they wanted to come back to the same community, to this community, and maintain that commitment to public service. They turned in one uniform for another, the uniform of the United States, to the uniform of the firefighters or the police or emergency medical personnel. Public service is what it was all about. Uh, if there's an emergency or, or, or if there's something happens to a family getting burned out, they're the first ones that are there to help you out, to do something for you in South Boston. You know, I'm glad we're doing this because people, I, I travel across the world, across the country, even when I was United States ambassador, and I, people would say, Ray, you're from South Boston. Tell me what's South Boston like? You know, I was in the Army with somebody, I was in the Navy with somebody, and I was just amazed with some of the stories and, you know, how much they respected the veterans. And it still exists today. It still exists today, and it's because of the, the older veterans, the World War II veterans, the Korean veterans, the Vietnam veterans. They showed us how to do it. They showed us how to get involved in South Boston, how to get involved in our country to give back making sure returning veterans and their families are always treated with respect and dignity. And uh, that's an important lesson for all returning veterans. It's not about you or your military service. It's about those uh, ahead of you, making sure that there's a path and a, a greater opportunity for those returning veterans. Yeah, that's exactly right, I think. You know, it's really not a memorial uh, remembrance of those people who 
served in the military. It's ones that served in the military and lost their lives right. in the service of our country. And that's a message that really is a, it's a message about sacrifice, a message about love. We have a function coming up in the summertime. We want to do it. We want to do it for a person who was never recognized. His name is Bob Moakley. He was the co-chair of this World Watch Committee with Eddie Tolland. And even when he passed away, there was nothing done for him. Well, the Fitzgerald Post is not going to forget him. We're going to have something right next to his brother's bench over here. And I'll have something over here for the committee members. And we'll, we'll have a grand time. We'll do it upright. Yeah, we, we're not going to forget Bobby. He was, he, was, he was a gentleman. He was so good to us and such a nice, such an awful nice man. So, you know, it's part of Saudi. You don't forget the people who were, who were there with you and were good to you and, and made things work the way that they should. And we aren't going to forget them either. So, we'll fill this place up with nothing but South Boston people who deserve it. Let me tell you. Now, as far as South Boston is concerned, we've seen many changes over the years. We've seen rents go up. We've seen everything, everything that you can imagine happen here. But we've still, that we've stayed the course and things have turned out right for us. And we just hope that people would understand that you can make a go of it and things can turn out right for you. And I'm so pleased that I'm able to tell you that today.